Nicole, thank you for being here, um, taking time out of your busy schedule. Like, I know it's got to be busy um, to come and talk to us a little bit and just give us a behind the scenes look at what it's like to be the head. Actually, I'll let you tell this part. I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going <laughs> to. Why don't you tell us who you are? How about we start there? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, really excited to be here with everybody and answer any questions and just have a fun time talking about turf and baseball or whatever y'all want to know, um, an open book. So throw the questions out. Um, I'm the head groundskeeper with the Baltimore Orioles. This is my, I'm going into my, actually yesterday was 16 years. So I didn't get a, a card or anything from the O's, but 16 years, uh, as head groundskeeper. Three years prior to that, I was head groundskeeper with the a minor league team, the dreaded Yankees affiliate, which is ironically our biggest rival, um, the Trenton Thunder in Trenton, New Jersey. And then prior to that, I was an assistant head groundskeeper. I kind of worked my way up from intern to grounds crew to assistant, then head groundskeeper in minor leagues, and then back to the big leagues for 16 years. So I have uh, a degree in agriculture from the University of Delaware. We did not have a turf program, but uh, it encompassed a lot of turf grass management, um, landscape design, management, irrigation, and the like. So, and also poultry production. I have a, um, a few classes in that. So if anybody wants to know about chickens, I'm your girl. Well, we know about chickens here in Northwest Arkansas. We've got a couple of bison <laughs> and Simmons and all these people who do pet food, human food, all yeah. kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. Is that like, you... Do you hear about Northwest Arkansas and in, in that in that world and the chicken world? I feel like it's got to be some sort of a hub. No, nah, I don't know because <laughs> Delaware is one of the top five poultry production states in America. You know, we have oh. Purdue, Mountain Air, Tyson Chicken. So it's a. Uh, I don't know. I haven't really focused on it too much, honestly. So Northwest Arkansas is not a not as big of a deal as I think. It's just it's just Walmart. That's all we. You're got. just there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, very cool. So uh, the next question I was going to ask is if you'd tell us a little bit about the grass that you've got there at uh, Camden Yards. Right. So we're in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, situated like really close to the Chesapeake Bay. And we have 100% Kentucky bluegrass turf, whereas um, about 30 miles south of us, our AA affiliate Bowie Bay Sox has Bermuda, uh, DC Nationals are about 30 miles south of us or kind of southwest a little bit. They had they had Bermuda, but then I think they no, I might be wrong. Was, the Redskins had Bermuda, which is close to us, and then Nationals have bluegrass as well, but they were dabbling in in possibly going to Bermuda. Philly's close, uh, also a cool season stadium. So you could really grow either grass, but for for us personally to manage cool season grass tour during the hottest part of the summer, like July and August, is a lot easier than transitioning from Bermuda to um a cool you know, transitioning the, the a cool season grass into Bermuda. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, the yeah, transition yeah. of grasses. So we just try to baby it as much as possible. Um, everybody on here is kind of like in the turf world or, or fascinated with it. And um, I get a lot of questions about like, you know, why, why not Bermuda? And, and there's no reason. I mean, I just personally prefer bluegrass. I think for, for us playing sometimes in March and hopefully in October, November one year, if we, <laughs> we're last place team right now. But, um, you know, one day we'll be back in, in the October baseball. So I think it's just easier for us to have the bluegrass and less disease and just feasibility of it, honestly. And we don't have any of the fancy, um, dra like not drainage, but the heating coils under the field. We're, we're 30 years old this year, which is <laughs> crazy to think that Camden Yards is now 30 years old. It's one of the oldest ballparks out there, but um, we don't have any of the fancy dancy stuff that the newer ballparks have. So just a hundred percent sand base, gravity based drainage and Kentucky bluegrass. Well, it looks amazing. By the way, I was there just a couple months ago. We went to an Orioles game and I thought it looked awesome. Um, Thank you. We're doing, yeah, no, it was, it was amazing, but leads me into my next question. I'm, curious what game day looks like what it take us through a game day 
in the shoes of Nicole Sherry. Oh, gosh. Well, it, <laughs> it starts off checking the radar to see if it's going to rain because it seems like, you know, every day there's a 50% chance of rain here in the mid-Atlantic. Um, so I'll start with that, and then uh, we'll cut the grass in two different directions every day. It's rare that during the growing season, which it, for, for us is really through July, but there might be a, a, a short stall in growth, but for the most part, we're cutting every single day. It's rare that we'll skip a day. If we do, it will only be like maybe a day. And if we, I'll go off on all these tangents, so try to like bear with me, everybody. But if we had to skip a day, we would get out there with uh, just your basic rotary home rotary lawn mowers and walk mow the entire field. So we're not ba bailing hay out there. Uh, we don't have any buckets on our uh, machines to collect any clippings. We'll recycle them pretty much back into the, the ground. Um, so we'll start with cutting the grass in two different directions. Uh, you you see our patterns, and that's how we get that. And then we'll work focus on the bullpens and get the mounds from the night before back up in shape and then focus the rest of the day on the dirt, which they don't teach you how to maintain infield skin or dirt or mounds or plates in school. So that's a really hands-on type of uh, job every single day. Um, water the dirt religiously, like every 15, 20 minutes throughout the day, and then set up for batting practice, break down batting practice, set up for the game, watch the game, do a couple infield, um, you know, drag store in the game, change bases. And then after the game, we'll completely redo the entire surface. So it's ready for the next day. So it turns out to be like close to a 12, 13 hour day, depending on how long the game goes, because recently, you know, we're dealing with like three to four hours worth of baseball and, um, it makes for a long day. Yeah. But we, it, 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 that's, that's, there's other things that occur during the day, but that's the basics. So do you, do you get to watch much baseball? Are you a baseball fan? Are you like during the game busy doing other stuff? Or do you actually just get like a TV back there and you and the crew, are you, are you watching it? What's going on? Well, if you've ever been to Camden Yards, we have a actual seating area in center field for the crew right center. It's a cage. We call it the crew cage. And my entire tarp crew and some grounds crew staff sit out there. There's about 30 seats in this uh, one area, Camden Yards. Um, and their main job is really to put the tarp on if if needed. It rains really a lot of the time here in, in Baltimore. So then they run out, pick up trash off the field, anything that gets thrown on the field from fans or just they're ready to go at all all times during the game. Me specifically, I am in an office that is located in right field on field level. There is a window that looks from right field line down to home plate. And that's my office window, which is really cool. If I I'll post a picture um, here soon on if I can while I'm talking. But for the most part, my main job is to watch the radar and deal with any weather concerns during a game. But I watch the game live and also on TV in, in my office. Oh, that's cool. I think when I was there, I might have noticed that, like you said, the cage, um, but didn't know that's what that was or didn't know that was who was me sitting in there or whatever. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really and fun. I saw, so we... Um, had Leah Withrow on here before, and and one of her TikTok videos was kind of funny to me because I think it's a misconception that people think, oh, your team is out of town, so you get a little bit of a break. Right. But that wasn't really the case. So tell us what happens when the team is away. No, when the team is out of town, that's when we do more of our cultural work. Um, you know, we'll aerate if possible. There's always some kind of extra event occurring, you know, because it is business, and we do need to bring in money to you know, not only our organization, but we're, we have sponsors that sponsor wall pads and beer and, you know, what have you. So we do host, um, a lot of sponsor oriented events, a lot of, um, youth, youth baseball events, generally for the most part, they're, they're baseball related events. So that's cool. It's rare that we have a concert. We have m &T bank stadium, which is the home to the Baltimore Ravens, literally, in the parking lot right next to us. So any big bands or concerts, um, you know, concert people would choose there for a better sellout with 70,000 seats versus 
Camden Yards, but in 2018, we did host our first concert ever, and that was Billy Joel, and it was a success. So it's really just finding the right um, client to play there and the right venue seating for those events to happen but that's you know for just a bit is that we set up and, and break down for a lot of extra events and then maybe movie shoots commercials um and then also the cultural practices that we need to do to the field of protein. so speaking of cultural practices maybe go in more detail it's uh, oh yeah how often are you mowing and what else are you doing? Let's just, let's get into the nitty gritty of turf care. Well, so it's, it's been different the last few years, you know, like a lot of more, um, cooler equipment has been accessible to us. Um, at the, specifically at the Orioles, I mean, very old school type of ball bar, old equipment. Like we our equipment, a lot of our mowers are about 20 years old. A lot of people think that, you know, your MLB must have all this money, but you haven't seen my shop yet. So <laughs> we, we try to like, you know, rig up anything that we can to keep it going for years and years. But, um, but we were able to get, uh, we got these really cool mowers and there's a variety of them out there. Some people use Alet mowers, some people use Dennis mowers. Anyway, it's a bigger ro rotary, not, sorry, a bigger real style mower that has these cartridges you can check out. So basically you can get it with a reel, but then you can pull it out and then put in a verticut portion, or you can put in these uh, springtime rakes that just kind of take, tickle the thatch and like remove a lot of thatch and dead material from the canopy. Um, verticut in has been something that we've really gotten into the last few years. Cause it's like, you know, coming up in this, we was like, you know, oh my gosh, and nobody ever verticuts bluegrass, but we started doing that, which has been really successful and, and shocking take a chance on it or wreck your turf um aerate all the time um we first maybe about full time a year if you can and you have the long season it goes from sometimes the middle of march until you know like i said hopefully october so finding good amount of heel time in between the actual game is is the when you're pulling cores because you don't want to disrupt the surface or have it open when you're when the team's playing on it and it's hot and you can't really get out there and cool it off or give it what it needs but we've been using ninja tines which i don't know i'm not here to promote any uh anybody's products so please don't think that i'm just saying like these are new innovative things that we've um you know started to use ninja tines you can get out there and they pull just the tiniest plug where you can like play same day. So in the high trafficked areas, like where the walk ups are, where the guys walk to the plate, um, in front of the mound, in between the catcher and the the pitcher, uh, we can hit that area with these little ninja tines that pull the tiniest plug that just gives it a little bit of air into those roots and breaks up a little bit of compaction. Any really high trafficked areas on your field where you can get out and play same day. Every week after the team leaves, we try our best to like needle time or solid time something, um, just to really break up compaction because that that's our that's the worst thing for us. We get a lot of compaction in areas, even though it's sand, um, sand based field, it just gets worn out because you know they're like creatures in the same exact path every single day. So anytime that we can get out and we do get with a lot of disease pressure being in the mid Atlantic. It's hot, it's humid. Um, sometimes we'll have 110 degree days with 98% humidity. So we spray on a two week basis preventatively. And then it, um, if we had to, we will spray curatively. Summer patch or patch diseases are our nemesis. And once you get it, you're always, you know, on the, on the cusp of having it every single year. Um, try to fertilize every two weeks. Uh, Maryland is restricted to only five pounds of nitrogen in a year. So managing that has been uh, different for us and or for me really coming up in this career. Um, they've really put a kibosh on like how much nitrogen you can apply to your, your field. So um, it's different, but it's beneficial. So we just try to do our best with the limited resources that we have. Is that was that long-winded. No, you're no, that's right. <laughs> I love it. Is, are you is that different residential versus you do you have different rules for nitrogen usage or any of that i think i think it is different um there, 
the state it really does regulate like we'll get checked every year for um number one pesticide applicators credits um you know make sure we have our license and we're keeping up with the science and also our fertilize fertilizer applicators license gets checked every single year as well so i don't know what uh long turf specifics are for nitrogen use but phosphorus use is banned like you, we can't put any phosphorus out i, went, and I, I don't know if probably... that's becoming normal uh, well, it's probably becoming more normal, isn't it? Like different states, but I, I would probably be a lot harder to regulate, you know, homeowners. I think, I, I don't know, than you, like, you know, that's, you're a pretty easy spot to come and say, Hey, are you guys doing everything you're supposed to be doing? You know, this is obviously a big field of turf. And so I, I don't know. I, I wonder if anybody, I've never <laughs> had anybody come and ask questions on my lawn, but I, of course, Arkansas also doesn't, I don't know that we have any, <laughs> any rules. Right. Um, I, th I think being so close to our waterways here in the Chesapeake Bay, they've really like really honed in on on controlling that a lot better than in the past on so both homeowners and landscape and golf and uh, professional and rec sports. I think uh, maybe I just missed it. Did you mention I was just curious if you mentioned a brand you've got your cartridge system on one of your on one of your sets of mowers. Did you say a brand you said? Uh, I said outlet. I said a uh, let mowers have that option. But we have uh, the Dennis mowers. And I mean, they're really great. They're game changers, in my opinion, like we have two ride on 3100 Toro D real mowers. Then we have your classic uh, greens mowers, your two walk behind 1600s, if if everybody understands what, what these numbers are, just like your regular golf course tee and green mowers. And then we have the Dennis mowers where we can, we specifically got them for the cartridge change out to be able to vertica, to be able to sp uh, spring time. They have a brush attachment that we don't typically use, but they're good for maybe soccer or golf or other kind of um, the sports play and um the real mowers cut nice they're really functional and easy to maintain um anyway not trying to promote them but just that's something new that we've been exposed to within the last few years that we're starting to utilize on uh, sports or baseball fields specifically they're used in soccer more often than not yeah, that's cool. I I had never heard of Dennis. I'm gonna have to look into that. I you know, I'll let, they make some homeowner caliber real mowers and and then also the commercial line. There's you know companies like Swordman who do the same cartridge system. That's uh, I think exclusively for homeowners. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, well, I'm late so. to the game. I might not have known that they anything like that existed since we have like dinosaur equipment. <laughs> so. well, I, think it's still, I think it's all fairly new. I don't think you're, yeah too far behind. But yeah, I didn't. I hadn't even heard of Dennis the brand. So that's that's something interesting. Yeah, they're um, both UK UK uh, specific um, companies. So really cool. Oh, okay. I know um, Cub Cadet has come out with something like that as well. Anyway, they're they're out there and they're they're really great. If you like an all in one machine, you know what I mean? Like for twelve, thirteen thousand dollars, you got three different options in one machine. I mean, it just makes sense for for budgetary reasons. Yeah, for sure. Which I didn't know Cub Cadet had it either. I knew they had what is it? Infinicut is what they call their. I think they're real mowers their whole line of greens mowers but i didn't know they had the, the cartridge system either see i'm behind you're you're educating me on <laughs> or i might be wrong i don't know so well oh what was i going to ask i had another question it was about oh i was going to say so we went up to baltimore up there we actually went up for the pga tour the the bmw championship is at caves valley which is yeah not right it rains it rains poor guys. well right so we uh we were there on the practice day it was beautiful weather we had great weather it was awesome our experience was amazing so um, but when we went up there, PGA tour is sponsored by, by John Deere. When we went up there, they told us we couldn't make, I'm, I'm a Toro guy. I think everybody kind of knows that, but, um, we couldn't make any, mo any videos for social media with Toro stuff. When we got there, we started looking at all the mowers and they were all Toro mowers. And so we were looking at my brother and I looking at each other, like what in the world, like, what are we going to do? And then the, the guy who was with us kind of finally said, you guys can do whatever. He's like, there are no, you know, John Deere mowers here because John Deere sponsors the, P the PGA tour. That's what we're supposed to film. We finally went down to the barn where they keep all this stuff. And the guys told us they were sponsored by Toro. So, okay. yeah, I was curious if you had, if, if in pro sports turf, if there are any relationships like that, or it sounds like you've got a couple of different brands of things going on. So not a specific well yeah, there are like in sports surf and I'm not going to speak for everybody in, in the industry, but like, you know, some, some people choose John Deere, some use Toro. We use Toro 
specifically because Turf Equipment and Supply Company, which which is a really great partner with us, um, is pretty much right down the road, whereas John Deere is more located in um, Western Maryland or PA. So, like, if anything broke down, they have um, Toro, Turf Equipment and Supply Company has road tax that can come out and service the equipment in house you know we don't have the feasibility to have a mechanic um you know on on staff but we don't have to send any equipment out they can come to us um it's just it, it's just a relationship that we've had for over 30 years from memorial stadium till now so um that's why we choose them but like i'm not really to if if I walked into a situation where it was all John Deere. I wouldn't be like, ah, we got to get rid of all this and bring in, you know, Toro. I think, I think both companies provide a need for our industry and um, provide great products as well. Which is interesting. I bet it probably does have more to do with who has a distributor close by because that maintenance aspect is, is for us. Huge. That's why, that's why it made sense. It's only like, you know, 20 miles down the road, whereas, you know, it would take a long time to get a service person from John Deere or, or wherever they're, you know, this is a big agricultural state as well. So like having a sports turf uh, mechanic would be, is, is a little few and far between to try to get to us. But anyway, um, no, we're not brand loyal. We're brand loyal only because like we own our equipment. We don't lease or do a trade option. Um, so like we keep our equipment for like, like I said, 20 some years, it's very hard for me. Number one, to justify a new piece of equipment. And number two, um, to have a, you know, just to have that relationship with Toro or turf equipment and supply company is just that much better. Like we do a, a, a trade deal where they'll get tickets and bring a lot of golf course superintendents or other people in the sports turf industry to games. And we'll get the use of a workman. And, um, we got the outcross this year, the, the right. Toro outcross. And I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it's a beast of a machine. We can do so much. We can throw the aerator on the back of it. We can use it in our uh, dirt bays to haul dirt and move dirt. So it's just a really versatile machine. But um, so we, we have that in our trade deal with them. But otherwise, we own everything else. Very cool. Yeah, the Outcross looks like an awesome machine. Um, I'll, now, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's get back to, I guess, grass and turf and the actual care of it. But when we talked to Leah, she we talked a little bit about how when she's watering, you know, kind of wetting down the dirt, watering different areas, it's kind of player specific. Do you have any of that going on? I mean, you have different players. Oh, from oh my gosh. That's yeah. you get into, you get into a lot of drama with that, especially with our team, because, um, you know, we're, we're a young team We're we're up and coming and we're growing. So there's not that veteran. There are some veterans on the staff, but like, They've only been playing a veteran for us has been like somebody who's been on our team for two years, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I think the, the most household name that we had was, uh, Chris Davis. And he was like the one that's been there the longest, but, um, for the most part, a lot of our guys are, are new. Um, just personally, like the guys will come out, the players, and when I say guys, the players will come out and if they like an area a certain way, I'll accommodate, but it's so hard on a daily basis to accommodate the water for third base versus shortstop versus second versus first, because, um, you know, you have different, it's a different day every day. It's like, you know, sunny one day, then it's hot and humid, uh, which plays part in a lot of the watering of the field skin the next day. Sometimes it's cloudy for three days in a row. Like, um, so it's just a lot. And I really try to keep everything consistent and water, I guess so what I basically would say is like if anybody was really picky about something, it would be the pitcher, the starter pitcher. Mm -hmm. And that's where I will really go out of my way to make him comfortable on the mount. As far as like the infielders, not so much unless they come to me the next day and say like, hey, it was too wet today uh, or last night in the game. Could you back off a little bit? Um, Trey Mancini, who is our, our you know, star athlete, um, he didn't like it as wet as the second and third and shortstop person enjoyed. So he would come up and just say, Hey, it was a little bit wet in my area. I don't care what you do for the rest of the field, but like, could you back off a little bit? So yes, player specific to, to, a to a point, but if you get into like, I, I mean, I don't know who's playing on a daily basis. So, yeah. um, 
you know, I, I won't go look at the roster and see who's starting and then adjust my day. I mean, I just go, I just go for it. And like at the end of the day, if they had a bad game, the groundskeeper wears it more than anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so whatever I, you know, you say to him, you know, if uh, our second baseman had a kind of a crappy game the night before, you know, the next day he's going to come over and say like, you know, Oh, I didn't get my stolen base because the dirt was raked differently or like, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're that needy. Um, I just like, Oh yeah, yeah. I'll back off or I'll rake in a different way. And like, and I don't change anything, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So you get to that level and then it's just trying to wear too many hats. And I just, I don't have the right. time or energy to deal with that. I was about to say, you probably have specific stories of players you could tell. Oh, there was. Like, and the yeah. coolest one was this this season, and I don't know if there are any Oriole fans on here or, or if anybody's, like, even recognized the Orioles um, a little bit, but uh, Cedric Mullins is our center fielder, and he went 30 stolen bases and 30 home runs in a season. So he went 30 for 30, and uh, uh, apparently that was a, that's a big deal. I don't know. I'm not a stat person, so um, – but for stolen base number 29 and 30, um, the outfield coach came to us and said like, Hey, Cedric said it's a little wet and that's probably why he's not getting his 29th and 30th stolen base. So could you back off on the water and just the running lane from first to second? And we did, and he ended up getting 29 and 30 at home. So that was pretty cool. That is cool. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm, I don't know the game enough to say like, you know, it being a little wetter than, than the night before that prevented you from having a stolen base, you know, you need to put on some cleats sometime and just run, yeah. you know, and then let yeah. it see yeah. what it feels like. Yeah. So how about like upper office management and grass length and do they get involved too much about, what well, you do, yeah, or? yeah, they do. So Baltimore, and if uh, I invite anybody on this chat to like, really, please, if you're in the area, try to reach out, find me and uh, come visit the ballpark. Cause uh, hopefully if everything opens up after uh, the crazy two past seasons that everybody's had to deal with, um, you know, we'll allow fans in earlier and be able to give tours and, and the like, but anyway, um, front office, uh, the main brass ownership is, um, is somebody that really wants to keep Camden Camden yards as classic as possible. So it's very rare that I will put in any crazy pattern, um, for the grass and our infield or infield and outfield height is I wouldn't say it's dictated by them, but like when you cut the grass shorter, it, it goes off color a little bit and they really love that deep green blue look on TV. So like we wouldn't cut it at an inch, like mainly our infield is an inch and an eighth to an inch and a quarter. And then our outfield and foul areas are, are really always kept at an inch and a quarter. So that's, that's really the biggest thing. No crazy patterns. Like, um, you know, really detailed patterns are, are on our field. They're mainly classic ballpark style patterns and the height of the grass can't really be too low. It's not even healthy for our turf, just where we're situated. We're 25 feet below street level. It's like a soup bowl down there. Um, so anytime you cut the grass shorter, you're just asking for more drama gotcha. with disease. Yeah. That makes sense. Like, I'm, so the the pattern thing. You just you think they have it's the personality of whoever is making that. Decision. Oh yeah, because I mean it's a it's a storied ballpark, right? It's historic. Yeah. It's a ballpark that you know forever changed baseball, right? Like our our focal point is our warehouse, which is this is pretty fun fact that a lot of people don't really know, but we'll blend three different colors of our infield top dressing and we use Diamond Pro, um, but a lot of people are familiar with Pro's Choice or um, you know, the calcine clay, but we use vitrified clay. We'll use two types of vitrified clay. It's a dark red and a brown. And then we'll have a little bit of calcine clay mixed in. So there's this recipe that Paul Zawaska, the first head groundskeeper at Camden Yards, um, came up with to match the warehouse. So our infield dirt and our warning track material color matches the warehouse. So as soon as you walk into the ballpark as a fan, your eye is automatically going up to that warehouse as the focal point. So th that's what I thought was pretty cool about. It's very classic. It's it, there's no, the field is meant to be a highlight of the warehouse. 
Yeah, I check. I, you, you remember Drew Miller? You were on with the uh, the high school turf program over there in, in Virginia, and, and Drew yeah. Miller. I think I remember you saying that for that, and it was really cool to see, like the focal point, like you're talking about. Um, it's yeah, that's different. I don't know. It's a unique ballpark. It's very classic. There's not a lot of fluff. I mean, up until like um, the late 2010s, we started putting more ads out on the wall pads. But when I was coming up in it, like it, as an assistant, we only had three advertisements on our wall pads. We only had three signs. Whereas if you look at other um, stadiums, and you'll probably see tonight, what if you watch the World Series or other ballparks that you enjoy at home, um, there's ads everywhere, right? There's beer here, there's, you know, cellular phones, there's this, there's that. But in Camden, it, it was usually traditionally only three big ads in the outfield. And now I think we only have six. So comparative to other ballparks, it's it's less less fluff, more focus on the ballpark itself. Um, although we had to, well, obviously, like it's a business, so we had to increase, you know, revenue somehow. Sure. Which I could probably go on forever, but I, you know, we've gone thirty minutes now. I wanted to see if oh, anybody okay. had questions Jeez. in there or whatever, <laughs> uh, so people can like raise their hand. I in have the so much to say. Yeah. And um, see if anybody has any specific questions they wanted to ask also, because I could probably just keep going. But, <laughs> or you could probably keep going. We could talk all night. Yeah. Some, if that's something specific. If you are in the audience um, and you want to um, ask a question, I think on the bottom left of your screen, you'll see like a little hand. And you can push that and it'll say, raise your hand and then we can call you up so you can speak gaining their nerves i don't know if you were going to continue i might have cut you off and if you were starting to say oh, something no no i was just going to talk about i mean i love talking about baseball the game um cool moments that i've experienced I, I i did see cal ripkin's last game ever as an oriole um that was cool we did win the al east championship in gosh i'm not really good with dates because every day like blends like you know groundhog day but uh, to, in 2014, we won the AL East, which was at home. And I think that was like one of the most remarkable things to be a part of. Um, I had a great relationship with Buck Showalter, and he would always be really picky about the field and come up with these like cockamamie like ideas. And I'm just like, Buck, that's not going to work. And like, he was like, you know, everybody else catered to him. And like, I was pretty much one that was just like, nah, it's not going to work. And like, I think, I think that's how our relationship got off to like a really good, um, stronghold because, you know, I, I didn't put up with his, you know, crazy ideas. Like he, he wanted to like make the warning track area around the dugout synthetic and then everything else, dirt, because he didn't like how the dirt tracked into the dugout. So no. he's just really picky about stuff. But <laughs> um, other things, like we have a sod farm or a little 4,000 square foot sod farm underneath our batter's eye right there on the field. So if we had to, you know, replace any divots or any bad areas, um, you know, we have that option, but like, it's really a really cool ballpark. That's classic. And we don't, we don't put a lot of fluff into it, but it still looks amazing. No, that is cool. Wait, so explain to me, maybe, I don't know what you said. The, the sod farm is where it's underneath our batter's eye. So the batter's eye in center field, big green uh, wall. Okay, okay, um, okay. Yeah. It used to have Ivy on it, but the Ivy was growing in like full sun and uh, for the people of Baltimore and, and Baltimore Oriole fans, um, you know, it was a legend that if the ivy reached the top of the wall, it was 33 feet tall is the wall. And if the ivy reached the top of the wall, that we would go to the World Series. So the ivy would get up to a certain point on the wall and just kind of like crap out, like it would be really leggy. And then like, uh -huh. you know, and then it, it would just like be bare areas and then brown and like the hitters didn't like that because they wanted a solid green or black surface. So we tore it down and that was like, oh my gosh, everybody's dreams were crushed. <laughs> like uh, there's so much like not hate mail sent, but like just really sad, sad fans about like, when are you going to bring the Ivy back? If we're, you know, we're going to go to the world series if that Ivy reaches the top of the wall. But what not many people understand is that, Ivy grows best in like shade, you know, or sunshade mix. And that was like full sun. And the, the wall itself was reaching with the heat gun at like 190 degrees on a daily basis. Like it was, you know, just, it just didn't have the right environment to grow. But 
on a side piece, there's a wall that's like adjacent to the seating, which is in the same location. And that ivy has been growing strong since 1992 when the stadium was built. So I like to always say the ivy's still there, everybody. It's just, you know, the original ivy is there. So try to like, you know, rally around that. But a lot of, you know, fans were really hurt about the ivy not surviving. And now we just have a big blank wall, which does look bad, but you can't really grow much in that area. Gotcha. Brian, we see you. Hey, there. Yes. A little technology uh, challenged here. Nico, I just Same. <laughs> Same. Up hey, hey. I've seen you for a long time. And How's it going? Conversation. It's great. I'm down in South Carolina now, growing sod. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. So, very informative. Good. Yeah. What kind of uh, sod are you growing, Brian? Uh, we're going to be growing Bermuda grasses and zoysia grasses. Oh, that's awesome. Zoysia has come such a long way. It, well, it has. We hope that it uh, gets back to the forefront and considered for athletics because I think it will have a place. So, Yes, absolutely. The coolest thing, and, uh, you know, not to, um, I won't go too long because I do want to answer anybody's questions. And uh, like I said, I'm open book. So I love talking about this stuff. Whatever y'all want to talk about is fine. Um, the Tahoma 31, which is like this crazy Bermuda grass. The scientists went on one mountain and grabbed this Bermuda grass and then went on another mountain and then grabbed another specific kind of Bermuda grass and then cross genetic did. And now it's like this Tahoma 31, which grows in like the coldest regions. So like up here, maybe in Pennsylvania, even, even like into New York, Tahoma 31 Bermuda is becoming a, a staple in the football um, sports. But I think that's cool too, because it uses less water. It, it can get through the cooler months than, you know, having to oversee with a lot of rye. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. Well, with zoysias, some of those were selected actually out of salt water, out of the ocean. Oh, that's so uh, cool. So there's salt tolerance, and especially when you're dealing with those kind of conditions. So, yeah. Yeah. We've come a long way in just the last 20 years with all those cultivars between Bermudas and zoysia grasses. It's such a cool thing. Yeah. But we still like bluegrass too. I love bluegrass. <laughs> and I mean, the genetics of blue have gotten so much better too. Like, you know, with just um, when I was in Trenton in the minor leagues, like we had the first, um, we didn't have it. What We weren't the first, but it, I was exposed to it first. Um, P105, which is like bred for football tolerance. So like the wear and tear and like the difference in a position area with the P105 bluegrass versus anywhere else was just phenomenal. I was like, this is a game changer. Yeah, the science keeps uh, keeps moving forward and pushing the envelope how far we can go. Yes, sir. Yeah. Spin and I are both fans of Tahoma 31 also. We, we each have some in our <laughs> respective areas. We're not too far away from each other, but we love Tahoma 31. Oh, and Left Tool also, he has some. Um, I did have a question. So a question from a, a direct message, the guy that said his raise your hand button wasn't working. Oh man. And, uh, yeah. He, so he said he's in Virginia too, and he's growing Kentucky bluegrass. And he was curious what you're rotating for your fungicide program. Oh my gosh. Put me on the spot here. <laughs> um, so, uh, gosh, T methyl. Um, I don't know if you want like trade names or anything like that, but I'll have to look back in my, my spray calendar. Um, we're just trying to really, we are impacted by summer patch. So anything that we can use to prevent any summer patch or large patch or cool season, brown patch is huge for us. Um, I really don't know what the trade names that we utilize, but I'll have to put that in the chat later, but, uh, just trying on a two week basis, uh, heritage or whatever, you know, the, the, the heritage has been really successful for us. Um, God, what else? I don't know. Can you write any more and ask it what I use? And I can tell him I'll have to look at my spray calendar. Yeah, you could probably write on the, like you said, put it in the uh, chat somewhere later. Yeah. Um, so I think I am going to actually head out. Spin says there are other questions in the live chat somewhere that he was going to maybe relay to you and get you some questions. Okay, yeah, um, for sure. But it was great to yeah. talk to you. And again, thanks for coming. But um, I'm going to head out and try to get these kiddos rounded up and ready for bed before long. Oh, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> but yeah, thanks, thanks for and, and everybody. I'll talk to you later. Thanks for being here. Hi. Yeah, I'm not in a rush. So anybody, like, don't don't rush out if you don't have to. I mean, I'm I'm here to talk.
I have yeah, till Evie. about eight thirty. Hey, Evie, you got any questions? Uh, yeah. Do you know what cultivars you use for the so bluegrass? The so the cultivars we're actually changing into the MVS um, three six five uh, coming up in two weeks. So we resotted. We're resotting our first. Um, not first, uh, our infield foul areas and our back arc. And it's going to be, um, bolt blue note and, um, gosh, what's the other one? There's one more that's going to be in that too. The Legend. existing, what's that, sir? Legend, I believe is the third one. Um, not a hundred percent on that, but possibly the cultivars that we currently have in the outfield in some of the areas are, um, oh gosh, P105, the uh, limousine, it's their older varieties, uh, limousine, midnight, and another darker variety. I have to look back in my, sorry, everybody, I'm not too swift with everything we got going on there. Wow, that sounds like the old 3D sod blend that you have there. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Midnight, P P105. Midnight, Moonlight. I think it was P105, yeah. Midnight, Moonlight, Limousine, and uh, uh, I think a newer variety. We did overseed with HGT, the Berenberg HGT, and then overseeded with straight blue note. Uh, and now we're getting the MVS... Um, Mountain Valley Seed 365 SS, which is uh, Bolt, Blue Note, and I think the gentleman said Legend, but I'm not 100% on what the third variety is coming. So I'm excited to see that. I saw it in the sod farm when I went to visit Tuckahoe Turf, but um, yeah. I'm excited to see it laid up next to the the older varieties. Do you yeah, use any... Adam, oh, Adam go ahead, Spence. Well, Adam spends a lot of time on this site, so he... He's here a lot. He's with uh, MVIS. Yeah, very yeah. excited to use those products because they're just better genetics. You know, it's changing so yeah. rapidly. So, but anything that can help us defend against summer patch, I'm I'm down for it. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, Evie, you have any more questions that you got? Yeah, do you use any turf paint on holding color no, either not... early spring or late in the well, fall? It's called pigment. Um, there sometimes, sometimes. So in the pet, we did not use any pigment or growth regulator this year. I'm not really a fan of growth regulator. I think it has its place uh, for us specifically. I think it hinders us for um, certain times a year rather than helps. But I know that's a, it's a battle with people. It's just personal preference and I just, anyway. But um, we have used pigments before, which is essentially a turf paint, but it just kind of like tints the the grass a little bit or, or puts a little bit of a pigment into the the blade of grass um, to get started when we had early games in March. But for the most part, we don't put any growth blankets on our field, let nature take its course. Um, if we had, you know, with the temperature, soil temps are starting to wake up enough to turn it green or be greener than than most um, lawns and such around Baltimore City. So, like, it still presents green. Um, have used pigment in the past, but um, it it was not often. And um, definitely a fan of them, though. It's a great resource to have if if color is such a big deal for the facility to get it started and to try to heat it up a little bit. Sure. Uh, do you have any agronomic uh, practices from the field that would translate over to homeowners? Everything. Aeration, uh, overseeding at the proper time of year, the uh, your water intake or how much water your usage um that, yeah, everything that we do on a major league field can be translated, you know, to a smaller scale uh, easily. But it, it's really just understanding what's in your soil, sending out for soil tests to really get a grasp and have somebody, you know, educate you on that if you're not personally educated on it. A um, lot of soil kits out there that you can, you know, mail in yourself or your university extension agent is there to help you, you know, each state should have a turf grass extension agent specifically to help you with 
any questions about your home lawn, you know, because, you know, the environment is, needs to be protected and overdoing any fertilizers or chemicals on your home lawn is, um, you know, a big no-no. So getting educated on that. Um, moisture readers, you know, any if you're fortunate enough to have irrigation, you know, how much water are you using? Does it really need that much water? Um, cutting techniques, cutting in two different directions if you can or switching your directions up really translates over to home lawns. Um, yeah, just aer and aeration, like just poking some holes and getting some oxygen in those, uh, in your yard, especially in the high trafficked areas. And uh, it will just be beneficial and just seed, overseed if you can. Sure. Do you have any advice for someone who's looking to get started in the turf industry? A career yeah we um, need you turf programs or colleges or anything um, like that what which, kind of advice which, would you give is that a question or is that yeah. just something that was someone but someone with? someone in the chat asked that yeah i i think for sure uh we need you in this industry so if you're interested if anybody really wants to work in in sports turf um there are jobs available and you you yeah, an education would be beneficial. Like I, I'll be an advocate for turf grass education or learning the science behind plants. But like, there's a lot of things that you can do and be very successful in learning as you go, hands on, on the job, getting your you know boots on the ground and uh, understanding and learning that in time. So, do you need a turf degree to be a sports turf manager? It would help, but no. And uh, I will say that to the cows come home. Like if you're interested in working outside, you understand the, whatever game of play, whether that's baseball, football, soccer, whatever your passion is, um, you understand that you understand how the dirt is an imperative part of the game for baseball. Um, and you don't mind physical labor. I think anybody can do this job and be successful for sure. And a turf degree helps, and there's plenty of community colleges that offer classes. If you're if you can only afford to take you know, a couple classes or you're interested to gauge your interest in this type of um, career, take a plant science class or take a soil science class, you know, something that gives you a better background of the guts versus, you know, the skin. Awesome. What's your thoughts on root pruning effects of pre-emergent on your KBG or um, is the stadium like a bit too isolated in terms of weed pressure? you don't necessarily so, have to use it well for the most part um we haven't had to spray any herbicides since 2009 it is a wow. monoculture grown in a very um isolated environment not that we don't have uh weeds uh, that grow but you know they're more manageable where we can just scout or use integrated pest management or ipm to go out and like um pick the weeds and make sure that they're you know pulled by the root um the the reason why I don't like growth regulators, I think it is very beneficial for the plant. It does a lot to promote, you know, lateral growth and like, you know, wider leaf blade and, and all the ins and outs of what a PGR can do. What I don't like is we get disease, you know, we do get hit with summer patch. And when we get hit with summer patch and if we're using a growth regulator, it's very hard to mask the summer patch um, defeat, if anybody understands. So summer patch will kill grass in like circular formations and being on TV every night or just, you know, the play that we have, I feel like the, the growth regulators don't allow me to grow the grass up a little bit to help fight off that disease or get it through the roughest part of that disease pressure. If that, that's just my personal yeah, no, opinion. That makes, that makes I'm not a scientist, sense. so. I don't really know what's happening in the plant with the growth regulators and diseases, but like, it just makes more sense for me to have a better aesthetic, um, in some situations than not. That's a, it's a big deal. Yeah, for sure. You don't want to be caught with your pants down kind of a thing. No. And you know, people will say something and like being 25 feet below street level and on a world stage, so to speak, like, you know, one, off spot in the grass and it could just be from a player you know catching diving and catching a ball out there like everybody's like oh what's going on out there and and yeah. people will let you know and it's not like you know it's it's a plant you know it's nature it's it's it is what it is but you know for the most part if we had if we got hit with summer patch and we can't 
control it fast enough. I want to do whatever cultural practices I can do to try to alleviate the strain of it. You have any superstitions on the field? I, well, I don't know. No, not really. I mean, I think we did, we did start the superstition that like, if like for in-game watering, watering is a, a big thing prior to a game. Like the groundskeeper is always out there or somebody on your ground staff is out there watering the infield dirt right before the game. And we had this superstition going for like the last three seasons now that if, if you watered the dirt and the team won, you would water until that team loses. So we, we had that, um, we had Matt Harvey, who is like, you know, a really great pitcher and he was called the dark Knight. So like on his nights, when he would start, we'd all wear black. Um, but other than that, no really big superstitions, like hopping over a foul line or, or how I know Dan Douglas with the Reading Phillies, it always puts in third base, uh, prior to the game. And he's the only one that can touch third base and put it in the ground. But I don't have anything like that. Yeah. How many people oh, are on? Wait, I do have oh, a yeah. superstition that if like, if my only superstition is like, if, if I get asked if it's going to rain today, um, it's probably going to rain. <laughs> so I tell, yeah. I tell everybody like, don't talk to me about the weather. Cause you speak it into existence. It's yeah. going to happen. So, so everybody knows that. How many people uh, do you have on your crew and what are the hours typically like? So the hours are for ground staff, which are, these are the people that work side by side uh, with me on a daily basis, game day, non-game day. They're there from 9 a.m. or 9.30 a.m. until about an hour and a half after every game. So it could be like a 12 to 13 hour day for them. We have a tarp crew that comes in. It's called, they're called the tarp crew and they're part-time seasonal and they're only hire or their only job is, you know, really like helping break down little stuff here and there, but, uh, for rain situations, they come in at 5 PM and work till about a half an hour after the game. But typically it's myself, two full-time assistants and, um, seven groundskeepers. And we're there from 9 AM until whenever the game's over and there when the team's away and pretty much every day. No, you're good. Oh, okay. I think we have one or two more Real questions quiet. maybe coming in here. I don't know if Spin has anything else in the meantime. Do heights of cut change between the infield and the outfield? I think you answered that earlier that it's yeah, so, relatively so we, similar. We cut, we cut our infield at an inch and an eighth, and then everywhere else is about an inch and a quarter. Sometimes if the temperatures are conducive, we can cut it down to an inch, but it's um, it's a little bit touchy for us just being in the climate that we, we have uh, to, to cut it real short. It can, it can really jack things up a bit with disease pressure. Yeah. So the high, low as low as possible without really putting it into danger mode. Sure. Do you oversee based on turf wear or time of year? Well, we we've never had to oversee, but we got hit with summer patch in 2018. We had 82 inches of rain in a year. It was like one of those 100 year wow. rainfall amounts. And we got smoked with summer patch. I'll post I'll post all this stuff in in my little thing that I have on this um, app. But um, we got smoked with it so bad that like the almost the entire outfield died. Like it didn't completely die, but it really formed all those circles. And then yep. that's when we overseeded. Also, we overseeded um, with a bit of ryegrass, which is like, ugh, kills me to do that on a, a monoculture. Um, when we had the Billy Joel concert, Billy Joel came at the end of July and it was a hundred degrees and we were really, you know, it was our first concert ever. And with the flooring down and everything for three days, we were really worried that, uh, the bluegrass wouldn't survive underneath. And we overseed it with rye and now we have a lot of rye grass out there. So you didn't yeah, utilize to, that, that sod farm that you had there. It's only 4,000 square feet. So if any, like if we had a detrimental death, uh, we'd have to haul in sod. So yeah, we were ready for all things considered that could happen. Um, but the sod farm really is only used for like repairing like umpire spots or position areas at second and short. And, you know, 4,000 square feet isn't really a, a lot when it's a 92,000 square feet of turf that was covered. Okay. Makes sense. 
Yeah. You, but well, um, we just started overseeding with the different types of blues, like the Blue Note and the HGT Berenberg, just to try to combat the summer patch. Um, you know, those grasses were more genetically blend blended for um, summer patch resistance. So whatever sure. we could could throw on it, we tried to. You know, if there's anybody out there that's that's thinking about getting into sports turf, I started in baseball, so I started working for the Royals when I was really young. But that, working baseball games and stuff like that really gives you both experiences where you can work the skin infield, the dirt, and you get to know, you get a little bit of knowledge on the grass. So that's the best way to start. And then that way you can figure out if you want to go football or baseball, if you want to get into sports, it's a, it's a pretty good opportunity. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's a lot of science involved, but like, you know, science changes rapidly. So anything um, can be learned on, on, on the job as well as, you know, like I said earlier, like some classes, but like, yeah, it's incur like study turf grass, if that's your passion and you want to get into like a lot of things with that uh, degree. But like, if you're just trying to get your foot in the door to see if this is a career path that might be of interest to you, like, you know, an education and just any, anything is, um, important, but not, you don't have to be turf specific. Like I said, at the beginning of the show, like I, I studied agriculture. So I have a big umbrella of things that I've focused on in my education. Um, you know, a couple gr head groundskeepers in major league baseball have business degrees and do this. So like, yeah, if, if you love grass and you love sports, why not? Are you using any soil amendment products like humic or sea kelp or anything? Yeah, so any we, other we'll, we, fluff stuff? Um, we'll use sea kelp a lot. Uh, we use aqua trolls, uh, these like pucks, and I'm not trying to throw out the just what I call them. So I'm not trying to like promote any brands. So please don't think that uh, there's plenty of competitive um, products out there. Uh, but they're made of they're watering agents or wetting agents, I should say. Um, that are made of like sea kelp that really do some really great things to help water stay in the soil longer, especially when you have a sand based field like we have. Um, humic acid, yeah, we'll put a little bit out, but um, it, it's touchy with us. You can only really do it in the fall or early spring, or else it really leaves like a, a brown tracking um, on the field. And again, like trying to be picky out the products, but. Um, you know, we're on TV every night and it's about aesthetics. So that's a big part of my job, you know, making sure everything looks as, I, you know, I'm not a perfectionist, but like try to make it look as perfect as possible. And you don't want these big brown streaks all over your field when you're on a ESPN game for sure. But yeah, we do use products that are beneficial for the soil. Yep. What's the biggest difference in field quality from the minor leagues versus the big leagues? Well, the the biggest difference really isn't about field quality because, like, some of these minor league fields are, like, impeccable. Number one, they have groundskeepers that are amazing at what they do. And number two, like, they're, they're really up to, to standard for major league play, right? Because, like, a lot of your farm system – is in the minor league. So a lot of effort goes into having the fields as suitable as possible for a major league, um, future athlete to play on. Um, the biggest difference is budget and, uh, help. Um, usually in the minor leagues, like you're out there by yourself, or hopefully you have maybe somebody else to help you, or you're relying on maybe another person who doesn't, you know, maybe is in the ticket booth most of the time doing their, their job there, come out and help you on the field. Whereas in major leagues, you're, you're more, you more have, gosh, your staff is really, um, either science background educated or really has the work ethic, um, needed for a successful field. So that's that's the biggest difference: budget and an amount of help more so than um, rough surfaces. Well, Nicole, we've taken a lot of time from you today, and it, it was worth the wait. And I've been trying to get you on here for a while, and you are amazing. My wife, well, thank you. Here, she said, "Man, that lady knows her stuff." 
Well, I mean, I learn every, I, I do not know everything. I mean, like I do have to go back now, find out what I'm using for my chemical thing. Now I feel like a dum dum for that, but, <laughs> and about the, uh, variety, I just slipped my mind, but I don't know if it's legend now. I'm like, no, that doesn't sound right, but you might be right. I don't know. Um, but I, I'm thankful for the opportunity. And like I said, like I'm an open book. So if anybody wants to reach out or if you're in the Baltimore area and you want to stop by, I mean, with this past year being COVID, I miss everybody. I miss seeing people. Um, I love talking about our industry and what we're doing and, and how it like, you know, can just be shared amongst all these avenues, whether it's landscape, lawn, uh, home lawn, you know, all the likes. So, um, email me it's n sherry at orioles.com just first initial last name at orioles.com or you can find me on twitter on this app or um you know yeah we have a page know somebody for you so yeah yeah we'll, we'll sherry page and people can put questions there and ask you questions and i appreciate your time that's why i built this thing to get professionals on here to educate you know people that really want to come up and start doing this as a career and help people yeah. along. So it's uh, I'm glad you're on on here, and I appreciate your time. Yeah, I'm gonna post uh, pictures of what the grass looked like in 2018. It was awful, awful. You guys would be like, oh my gosh, I, like literally, like you, uh, as a head groundskeeper in the major leagues, you know, one brown spot on the field, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, right. you're gonna get fired. But like you imagine, like when the whole field and there's nothing you could have done to prevent it, like presents like in a in a dead pattern. You're just like, uh, what do you what do you do? You know, yeah. you. Yep. And then I realized like I've stressed out my whole life for no reason. In because you know mother nature wins in the end regardless and nobody's going to hold you accountable for that yeah that's that's exactly right well as, right. A, as a homeowner i know summer patch and pythium are probably the two things i would despise yeah. the most to get so totally understand it looking like crap during that Bad patch right, because it's had. always like the, we always say, like, oh my gosh, the field looks amazing, and then like two days later, it's like it starts to take a turn for the worse, and you're like, ah. Oh. So um, I'll post some photos of that and like where my crew sits and just like the viewpoint of the game. But I really hope you all enjoyed this, and you know, oh, reach awesome. out for sure. It was great. I really appreciate your time for this, and we awesome. can, we'll have you on again. We'll awesome. Yeah. Anytime. All right. Thanks. Thank you.